A few years back, working with my dad's demolition company during the summer, I ended up at Newcomb Hospital in Vineland, New Jersey. The hospital was abandoned, but in good shape and structurally sound. At lunch, I'd throw on a respiratory mask to protect from the mold in the ceiling and walk through the halls. There was something so inherently interesting to the process of exploring this abandoned place, removed entirely of its context. It'd be impossible to know the true history of it. This curiosity, of course, isn't anything new. You only need to look at the hobby of urban spelunking, or urban exploration, or the curiosity surrounding the abandoned town of Pripyat in Ukraine, evacuated after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. These places were designed to house and be interacted with by humans, just like the hospital. But something in their history caused them to be forgotten, gigantic relics to the recent past. Newcomb Hospital only closed in 2004, and yet it stands locked in time. Architectural trash, garbage with four walls and a roof. Demolition of Newcomb Hospital has been underway for some time, but it's likely I'll be one of the last people to walk its halls. Is there a way to replicate this feeling? without dealing with the inherent danger of going into an abandoned place, not to mention the legality of the situation. I think there is, in the form of certain older video games. I got the concept for this project from thinking about the video game Animal Crossing. With the newest release coming out, I thought it'd be interesting to look back at the series' roots, and what it might look like now. Animal Crossing was released for the Nintendo GameCube in North America in 2002. Essentially, the game was a life simulator. Players would move into a new town and become responsible for its upkeep and growth. They could participate in a multitude of activities, including collecting bugs and fish for the museum, picking fruits, talking to townspeople, and meeting with visitors. One of the most interesting aspects of this game was the real-time clock. Events in the game would progress based on the system clock of the GameCube, and certain things could only occur at specific times, such as specific characters showing up in your town or holiday events. Additionally, the clock continued to tick, even when you weren't playing, resulting in effects that gave the appearance of deterioration within the town. If left for too long, weeds begin to grow, and the other townsfolk will remark on your absence. My curiosity began in thinking about what it would be like to go back to one of these old towns blowing the dust off of an old GameCube, and finding the memory card, and seeing what the villagers might say to me if I've been gone for 18 years. Admittedly, it's terrifying to think that my Animal Crossing save is now old enough to drive. What would I see there? Would the town still exist as I remember it, picking up where I left off? Or would it be a void of fed-up townsfolk, insulted that I'd left them for so long? There was a day where I turned on Animal Crossing, played for a bit, and then never went back. Unfortunately, my GameCube was lost in the countless moves I'd made since 2002, and buying an old memory card was prohibitively expensive, especially for a school project. But I wonder if anyone else got their hands on my save file, or if this simulated world is currently rotting away at the bottom of a trash heap. Is this cruelty? In my time, I believe I've left more games unfinished than completed, but due to the linear nature of most games, this is more akin to putting a book down or stopping a boring movie. Animal Crossing is a living place designed for my interactions. Without me, the game will continue to pointlessly spin on, running through simulated events with townsfolk wondering about my absence. Now, I'm not a fool. I understand that this game is a simulacrum of a living place. Bits of data and code designed to make me feel like it's alive. The characters aren't walking around in the town without me there. They're placed in storage, in memory. And they simulate ambulation when I turn the game on. My point is, how is that different from how we experience reality? To me, the world is nothing but the translation of electrical signals issued by my sensory organs from outside stimuli. The world, as I perceive it, is itself a simulacrum, a projection onto my brain. And even then, it's a system that doesn't even work 100% of the time. I'm reliant upon my memories to place context on the things I'm perceiving. Otherwise, it's nonsense. Now, aside from getting existential about Animal Crossing, this video has a point. Namely, in regards to the cost of maintaining these virtual places, these digital realities. Animal Crossing, by comparison to a lot of games, is a rudimentary system. Events are scripted based on the internal clock and overall progress of the town is saved to an external memory card. As players load into the game, their town is reconstructed based on their progress. Then, the game checks against the system clock for any events, or to help modify the weather. 
December will be snowy, June will be hot and full of bugs, etc. Despite its simplicity, this process goes a long way in creating the verisimilitude of Animal Crossing, and it can be seen in a multitude of other games, namely MMOs. Like Animal Crossing, MMOs, or massively multiplayer online games, require physical storage to house players. Players download files to their computers that make up the digital landscape, then that landscape is matched to other players on a remote server. For example, the most popular MMO, World of Warcraft, has servers in Chicago, LA, Sydney, Frankfurt, and Paris, providing service to millions of players around the world. Each of these locations house a multitude of servers, so as to keep players from overwhelming them. Upkeep on the servers alone costs more than $150,000 a day in 2010, which, admittedly, is a bit of an outdated statistic. What happens, however, when we look at an MMO on the tail end of its life cycle? At the end of the day, they need to perform the same functions as WoW and other MMOs, but at a much smaller scale, and likely at cost. A failing game on the scale of WoW does not exist, and cannot exist without the support of millions of players. But looking at something smaller can maybe reveal the same feeling as returning to an Animal Crossing save. Enter Dragon's Prophet. Released in 2013, Dragon's Prophet was an MMO developed by Runewalker Entertainment, focused on action-based combat and collecting a huge number of dragons that populated the game world. Many reviewers described it as draconic Pokemon, with players focused on collecting these dragons so that they'd assist them in combat and provide transportation through the game world. On release, the game received middling reviews and currently sits at 63% on Metacritic. The game struggled in the MMO scene and eventually its servers were shut down in 2015. That is, until the game was re-released as Savage Hunt in 2017, with help from European MMO studio Gamigo. However, after a consistently low player count, the servers were consolidated in 2018, leaving a single server still in operation. This server provides service both to the EU and North America. Now, to be clear, I did not enjoy my experiences with Savage Hunt. The game was clunky to say the least. Its incredibly complicated systems were communicated ineffectively to casual players, and I often found myself drowning in a sea of context-free menus and feeling like I was constantly doing something wrong in combat. Leveling and questing was very grindy, with repetitive, unnecessarily difficult combat. I died. A lot. But, due to the single server, I was rarely totally alone. Other players would sometimes fly by on the backs of massive endgame dragons, while I got beat up and mugged by goblins below them. I only ever had one meaningful interaction with another player, when I came across a horde of players just... standing there. Apparently, the endgame requires the hashing of dragon eggs, a rare resource that would provide players with powerful dragons. In order to do so, however, players would have to hold the eggs. So for some people, gameplay involved simply logging into their character and standing around holding eggs for hours while they did something else. This player explained to me that this was the only way to get Dragon strong enough to participate in one of the two endgame raids. This player had been playing for a long time, and had only ever managed to complete these raids a few times, rarely getting enough helpful people together to attempt it. Though I didn't have enough time or interest to make it to the endgame, I experienced this phenomenon a bit in an early dungeon. I came into the region underleveled and unable to find enough players to join me in completing it. So for a few hours I threw myself at it, carefully pulling and dispatching enemies with Big Sally's trusty bow. The boss however proved to be incredibly difficult, and even with the help of my strongest dragon companion took a few profanity laden attempts to complete. The feeling of beating this dungeon on my own was frustrating, and in some respects antithetical to the idea of a massively multiplayer game. I could see other players in the game world, but of all of them, only one ever helped me, and even then, it was just to explain why people were standing around doing nothing. The feeling I couldn't shake was that somebody in Europe was maintaining a server, paying upkeep costs in order to make sure I had this experience. The physical toll my frustration took extended across the Atlantic. I'm sure that, to some extent, this game is somewhat profitable. In addition to the complex character systems, there also existed three different types of currency, each of which could be purchased through in-game transactions or daily login prizes. Also, the cost of maintaining a single server is likely astronomically smaller than the cost faced by the likes of Blizzard. Even still, playing Savage Hunt was a unique experience. The world was designed to be interacted with by hordes of players, and even though it's significantly smaller than other MMOs, that interactivity still existed. However, in places where these connections were absolutely necessary, such as raids or dungeons, it was an insurmountable task to get people to join up. 
even for high-level players, this massively multiplayer game is a massively solitary experience, one I'm sure was not intended by the designers. In the end, I'm not sure my experiences with Savage Hunt were what I'd feel with a game like Animal Crossing. I'd expected to find empty hubs and non-working functions, but in the end it seems pretty similar to my experiences with other MMOs. The act of playing a truly dead MMO is increasingly difficult, as games like WoW swallow more and more of the market. Perhaps I'm just not a fan of the genre, but these experiences have always been incredibly dull, even in huge games like WoW. Perhaps, like real life, the experience of being in a truly abandoned place is one that is, by definition, difficult to do. We can try to find these places, but their existence is fleeting. Today, my experiences with Newcomb Hospital will likely be its last interactions, just as my town in Animal Crossing will likely be lost forever, save in the memories of some plastic chip buried in the earth. Even then, one day Savage Hunt will be closed down, the last player will log out, and the server will go abandoned. What will it be then? other than the memories of the people who played it.